this country is at war with Germany. With Germany. We shall go on to the end. I remember the sheets of flame which came up and almost blinded us from our guns. Hello and welcome to another episode of the World War II podcast. In episode 158, I talked to Henry Sledge about his father's experiences with the US Marines in the Pacific, which led me to rewatch the 2010 mini series, The Pacific. Now, the show revolves around three lead characters Eugene Sledge, Robert Lecky, and John Bassalone. Bassalone received the Medal of Honour for heroism above and beyond the call of duty during the Battle of Henderson Field in the Guadalcanal campaign and would go on to be posthumously awarded the Navy Cross. So in this episode, I'm joined by Dave Holland. Dave is a former US Marine and Battlefield tour guide on Guadalcanal. On his YouTube channel, Guadalcanal Walking a Battlefield, Dave takes you, the viewer, to the island and explains the battlefields and show you what exists today from the Second World War. But before we get started, it's a big thank you to all those who have supported the podcast by becoming patrons. A dollar or so from people like you, loyal listener, help me find the time to put the show together. Now you can find out more at patreon.com slash ww2podcast. I really do value your support and where possible I try to make available extra bits and bobs exclusive for patrons. A bit more World War II chat, as it were. So that's patreon.com slash ww2podcast. So on to the main feature. Dave, thanks for joining me. So John Barcelona, um who was he? What's his upbringing? Where, where, where's, where's he coming from? He was born, I think, 1916 in, um, in New York State to an Italian family. Um, I don't know what his, his parents did, but, you know, they, they, he wasn't upper class or anything like that. He was just from the working class, typical Italian migrant family at the time in, in New York. I think he might have been born in Buffalo, New York, but then he migrated to um, Raritan, New Jersey. Um, I guess he grew up a, a, just a typical lifestyle of a, a New Jersey kid at the time. There's a bit of conflicting uh, records, but I've got John Bassalone's um, own testimony, and it was a, it's a transcribed testimony in 1943. Uh, he gave in September of 43 to two Marine officers in Quantico, and this was when he was on his war bonds tour um, when he, he left Australia and was ordered to go back to the States. And then one of these uh, officers is from the Marine History section, and another one's from the Marine uh, a press officer. So they're basically sitting down in a um, – it's a – recording i don't have the recording but i have the the transcription of that recording um it was declassified in 1957 it was from the navy history and um, library and i've really never seen this referenced anywhere else in any of the books on on, on Barcelona. but it's Barcelona's own testimony and he's giving it to two marine officers myself i come from an investigator's background and this was a, a gold when i came across it and um because it's basically Baselon, they start out and they said, tell us your story. And it's mainly concentrated around his Medal of Honor actions and his actions on Guadalcanal. And when they they started, he, you know, he, he's very, you can tell he's um, a bit, um, I guess no one say, uh, he wasn't too sure or full of himself or anything like that. He tells a very basic story. And they said, oh, I did this, 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 this. And it was fairly basic. And then, then the two officers, just like two, I guess, professional investigators started drilling down you know, asking, you know, very pertinent questions. And, and so much they were drilling down. They were asking, for example, when he mentions fighting hoes, so he said, my sections had two fighting hoes. They said, okay, what's the distance between those two fighting hoes? Oh, 30, you know, 30 yards. Oh, there was wire out in front of my, my post. How, what was the distance? You know, how many rounds did you fire? Did you fire one? Did you load them? And he got so much detail. This is, this is classic in, in its gold. To get back to the original question. So he leaves school. And I've read conflicting reports that he joined the U.S. Army in 1934. But during this interview, they've actually asked Bassalon, when did you join the Army? And he gives the month and the date. And he, he basically says, you know, in, in June of 1936. And then asked him how long he was in the U.S. Army for. And he said three years. He got, in, he got out in 1939. So he joined the U.S. Army. He was initially sent, I think, Fort Dix, which is on the East Coast. He was there for a few months. And he says, look, I wanted to go overseas to the Philippines. We volunteered to go to the Philippines. So he sent to the Philippines in 1936, and he joined the 31st, 31st Infantry Regiment. And the 31st Infantry Regiment was the um, regular Army, U.S. Army unit that 
um, was a garrison of the Philippines. And these guys later, um, unfortunately, was involved in the Bataan Death March and in the invasion of the Philippines, the 31st Regiment. But he was in the 31st Regiment. He became a, a bit of a celebrity there because he was known for his boxing skills. So he was an undefeated boxer. And he, he was a machine gunner, so heavy machine guns. Um, so they fired the um, M1917 heavy machine gun. So they, they kind of, um, you've probably seen photos of them, the larger machine guns and they've got the tube on the end with the water cooled. So the water cooled machine guns and had the big tripods and they were the heavy, heavy guns. They weighed about a hundred pounds with all that. The kind of those first world war looking things with the water jacket on there. They're real big, heavy things, aren't they? Yeah. They're based on the wall. They had a 1917 model. So that was the you know, year it came out. But anyway, he was a, in the U.S. Army, that was his that was his role. He was a heavy machine gunner and became very proficient with the machine gun. So he got out of the Army in 1939. Is, just out of curiosity, you might not be able to answer this. The Philippines at this time, do, do they, is there any action going on? Do they see action in the Philippines? I don't know how much of a... I don't know which... It's an American history question, really, but, but I don't have an answer to. Is, it, it, is the Philippines... Is there a, a, some sort of uprising or or is it just a garrison duty there? It was more of a garrison duty. I mean, in, in 1900, 1901, 1902, they followed the Filipino campaign right after the, the Americans uh, gained, uh, gained it from the Spanish in the Spanish American War in 1898. Um, <clears throat> there were reports of like of some bandit actions and things like that, but there was no, um, he didn't go on anti grill or anti insurgency campaigns. Yeah, I had visions of them, sort of some weird anti, anti insurgency, and he's sort of looking through the. Uh, the, the jungles of the Philippines. It always been a kind of a proto version for him of the Second World War, <laughs> rather than. Uh, I think the only parts they got in was in the boxing ring and in the bars, you know, and that's that's why they always want to go back to the Philippines. It was good. good. So why why you you started to tell me why did why did he come out of the army or is he was he just on a three year contract? I guess he was a three year enlisted for three years and he came out of the army in nineteen thirty nine. And then he um, the reports say I can't confirm this, but he went obviously went back. Uh, to New Jersey, and he drove trucks and probably had a few odd jobs. And it was only less than a year after that he enlisted in the U.S. Marines. I've heard a couple of reasons, but in this interview, they actually asked him because he, he drilled down. They were asking his dates and uh, when he came out of the Army and went in the Marines. And he said, you know, why did you join the Marines? He said, I wanted to see some action. And of course, this was 1943, which was probably one of the reasons. But, but he joined in 1940. So, you know, as you know, the U.S. wasn't at war in 1940. But the Marines were reported and they were selling themselves at the time, you know, we're going to be the first to fight, join us if you want to fight. Um, there's other reports that said that um, he wanted to get back to the Philippines. He wanted to go back to the China because he liked that, you know, the, the far east. And so it was probably a combination of both. I mean, I think he said in newspaper reports and maybe to families and friends that he, he wanted to get back to the Philippines or get back to the, the Asia because the Marines at that time had a, a large garrison in China, you know, the famous China Marines. So, and that was real good duty at that time. Anyway, he, he enlisted in the Marines in uh, June of 1940. And the thing here, you know, I, I went to U.S. Marine Corps boot camp and, you know, I was, you know, I did eight years in the Marines and they always, you know, John Bassalon is a legend in the Marines. You know, always hear about Bassalon, Bassalon, Bassalon. And, you know, I think even when I went through basic training, they said, well, you know, Bassalon went through basic training. You always hear that. But in this interview, and I've confirmed it in a couple of other sources, Barcelona did not go. You know, if you're if you're a Marine listening to this, cover your ears. Barcelona did not go to Marine Corps basic training. You no, know, he wasn't so you know good when he walked in. They go, this guy doesn't need to go basic training. But it was a comment at the time. If you had service, especially in the U.S. Army at the time, and Barcelona actually says in his own words, he goes, "No, because they accepted my U.S. Army." training already because he had just done three years in the army and, and been out of the army less than a year. So he went straight into a Marine infantry unit. Um, after that, they said, what do you do? What's your job skill? He said, I'm a machine, machine gunner. So they sent him into D company for the first battalion, the fifth Marine. So as soon as he enlisted, they sent him straight to the a regular infantry unit as a machine gunner. That wasn't a one-off. I mean, if you look around those times, especially even when the war started, some Marines didn't have to go to basic training if they've had, uh, prior military training. By 1940, they're trying to expand the army really fast. So presumably, if you're putting every man through basic training, it's going to slow down the expansion of the military. Whereas if you've got someone who's already done his basic training, all you've got to do is get the match fit so you can send them to their unit. It must have been 
Yeah, it's probably probably along those lines. I mean, there was a bit of common sense going in those days. Is that how he ends up a sergeant then? Because he's also served. Yeah, so he, I don't know what rank he was. I think he, he probably started as a, a proud first class. I tried to get into his muster rolls and records, but there's, some records are closed off. But I imagine he came in as a PFC. Um, I don't know when he picked up corporal. He probably picked up corporal quite quickly after that because he, he was a squad leader, machine gun squad leader, which normally the rank is corporal. And they sent him to the first battalion, fifth Marines. You know, and, and some Marines think, oh, you know, John Bassalone was always associated with the seventh Marine regiment, which he was. But at the time, the seventh Marine regiment did not exist in 1940. Um, it came along in 1941. The first Marine division came along in January 1941. So the fifth Marine regiment. They were based um, in Quantico, Virginia at the time. So he joined, went in D Company of the 1st Battalion, the 5th Marines as a machine gunner. And then in I think January or early 1941, then he's transferred to D Company, machine or a weapons company, which was called 1st Battalion of the 7th Marine Regiment. And that was the regiment he um, was with on Guadalcanal, the famous uh, 7th Marines. Um, and at that time, um, his battalion commander was probably the most famous Marine of all time was um, Lewis Chesty Puller. So, you know, you had a, a few legends already in that, in that unit, but you know, Puller was a legend at that stage. I mean, Bassalon, what, Bassalon was just a, you know, a very competent uh, machine gun uh, squad leader. So when the war kicked off in December, um, he was actually in uh, New River and New River is, is nowadays called Camp Lejeune, which is a large Marine Corps base on the East coast. And the, the other Marine Corps base is Count Pendleton on the West Coast. And the 1st Marine Division was East Coast base, and the 2nd Marine Division was West Coast base. And nowadays, it's flipped. So the 1st you know, Marine Division. And I'll, I'll, I'll say something now that a lot of Marines, it's not a pet peeve, but sometimes it avoids confusion with units. Now, if you ever heard the term 1st Marines, they're not talking about the 1st Marine Division. They're talking about the 1st Marine Regiment or the 7th Marines or the 5th Marines. When they say Marines, that means regiment. So like in other um, Western countries, it could be, say, for example, the 25th um, Infantry would be a 25th Infantry Regiment. But it's sometimes I read reports or you hear people say, you know, the, the, you know, the 7th, you know, the, the 6th, the 7th Division or whatever, you know, it wasn't, or 7th Marines. It was no 7th Marine Division. It was 7th Marines. So sometimes that can be com- confusing if you're reading um, reports and things about Marines. But he was in the 7th Marines, the 7th Marine Regiment, which is part of the 1st Marine Division. You can get confusion with all these numbers. So they, so if we look, just think of the timeline. So they're not shipped directly to Guadalcanal, which we're going to get to. They first shipped to Samoa, isn't he, Barcelona? Is that a staging point? Do they know they're going kind of thing? Well, it wasn't a, it wasn't a staging point. It was a garrison point. So what happened was, as you can remember, when the Japanese were pushing, and they were on the offensive, even after Midway, they were still pushing on the offensive. I mean, Midway just gave them a slight setback, and it, it, it actually shifted the momentum a, a, a bit so the, you know, the Americans could – go on the offensive a bit earlier than they were planning. But what happened was when they, when they were pushing down, they've taken Rabaul, um, they were pushing in that Southwest Pacific, the Japanese. So there was a big fear that the Japanese were going to hit New Zealand, potentially Australia, but definitely Samoa, Fiji, New Caledonia, you know, all, and, and, and cut off that vital supply line to Australia and New Zealand. So, you know, if they kept pushing down, they had that victory fever, you know, they said, we can keep pushing you know, especially the, the Japanese Navy. So that was their idea. So the Americans, after December, when it came to January and February, they said these islands were at risk, especially New Zealand and, and Australia, because their main uh, troops were still in the Middle East. And that's why you see the 6th Marine Regiment of the 2nd Division was sent to Iceland. And that was pre-war. They were sent to Iceland. The Brits pulled out, and they sent them to Iceland to garrison it. You know, they, they, it was like the Churchill kind of a deal. The same thing with Samoa. They said, we need to garrison these guys. So what we need to do is let's take our best regiment we have in a division. And what we'll do, we'll flesh it out with some of the best NCOs and officers from other regiments, send our best equipment, equipment for the most modern stuff we got and ship them out real quick. You know, attach a, an artillery battery and a tank platoon with them, call them a brigade, which they called the third Marine provisional brigade and ship them very um, quickly to Samoa because they're going to probably be fighting in Samoa. So they became the Samoan garrison. So, and it was quite ironic because these guys, like, you know, Puller, another famous Marine, A.J. Hannikin, you had, you know, Bassalone, Mitchell Page, all these Marine legends that later became legends. You know, they, they were the best NCOs and officers of the division. 
thinking they were going to be the first to fight. But ironically, they were the kind of the last to fight for the division because the division landed in Guadalcanal in August. And these guys are still sitting in Samoa, kicking themselves, going, oh, this is crazy. And, and it's a funny thing when, you know, when uh, the seventh Marines finally landed, you know, uh, the famous Marine uh, mentioned before Chesty Puller, he hits the beach, you know, in typical Puller fashion. You know, he says, where's the Jap- Just point me to the Japanese. Where are they? Where are they? And had someone hands him a map and he goes, I can't make heads or tails of this and throws them out. And they said, just point me. Where are they? And they said, Nose Hills. He was, that's where I'm going. But then, uh, there was a couple of um his his old friends who were lieutenant colonels said oh about time and they were you know another story is they they were kidding and laughing and go oh about time you got here puller you know the war's over with you know what you been doing but yeah so they sent them to to garrison Samoa and so they were there in August the seventh when the rest of the division reinforced uh, landed on the island of Guadalcanal and Tulagi in August the seventh forty two puller always abuses me he. he- It'd be interesting to see uh, if someone's rewritten these, these sort of little quips that he makes throughout the war because he is absolutely full of them and they're fantastic. Uh, like the one about, I've got them where exactly where I want them. You know, we were, surra- we were surrounded, I've got them where I want them. You know, that kind of thing. I, the, the, he's fantastic. He's full of them. But presumably, when it, when they realised that Samoa was not under immediate threat, they shipped them to Guadalcanal to reinforce Guadalcanal. Do they know what's coming at Guadalcanal are they are they aware of of uh you know is Samoa even close to the the no it's not it's not close but they were very aware that the fight was not. well I would say the geography the you know are, are they are, are they in sort of an environment that's similar or is Guadalcanal a big difference no they were, they were getting acclimatized which was good you know that was a thing and then they were really training them hard you know doing a lot of pack marches and up and down ridges and hills they didn't they do a lot of jungle top training so they knew they were they were going to be especially after August the 7th they were going to be sent in and in fact, they, um, they were going to send them to a, to hit another island and, you know, the powers to be. And finally, yeah, I think um, Admiral Nimitz uh, made a trip to Guadalcanal and he says to spoke to the division commander, which was Archer Vandegriff. And he says, look, you know, I need I need whatever you got, send it to me. And at the time, they wanted their their other regiment before that, the division has three rifle regiments and they took the seventh from them, but they gave them the second Marine uh, regiment. They put them on loan, to, and they they did have uh, three rifle regiments. So yeah, they um they were training very hard on Samoa, getting ready to go, and they knew what was happening on Guadalcanal. Obviously, they were hearing about the fights, and you know, and then finally they got the order to to go. So when we get to Guadalcanal, when they arrive, what is the situation? How long? Had, how long? I mean, how long had the uh, Marines been on Guadalcanal when they arrive, and how far? Uh, through the campaign, oh, that's not a question I want to ask. I was, I was sort of how big, how big is their perimeter? You know, how, what kind of inroads are they making of, of the campaign when the uh, Barcelona arrives? So at the time, that was the, the first Marine. Oh, sorry, the um, the Seventh Marine Regiment was part of the first large resupply that they had. So they landed on August the seventh. And I think some of you viewers or sorry, your listeners might know that, you know, the U.S. Navy had pulled out due to the Battle of Savo Island with the, you know, probably the largest, the largest surface defeat in U.S. Navy history. And they pulled out and left with like half their supplies. So the, the 7th Regiment landed on the, um, the 18th of September. Now, two battles had been fought, very important battles already in the campaign. One was the Battle of the um, Teneru River which was really the Ely River, or a lot of you people know it as the Battle of Alligator Creek. And then the second one, probably more important, was the Battle of Edson's Ridge or Bloody Ridge. That was probably the closest the Marines ever came to losing the campaign. Very, very important battle that was had strategic and implications throughout the rest of the war, and especially the South Pacific. So you had two battles fought there. That was the first U.S. offensive, but it, it quickly became a defensive because what they did, once they landed there, the, the main objective was to take that nearly completed airfield that the Japanese had, had almost completed. That was the, the main objective. Once they took it, then they had to hold it because I know the Japanese would, would come back very hard with a, a counterattack. So that was the unsinkable aircraft carrier. You know, that was the main reason they were there in the first place to, to um, prevent the Japanese from taking that airstrip to interdict the um, the shipping lanes. Before that, Vandergriff had a horseshoe-shaped uh, perimeter. So on both flanks and in, in, in the front, so they were expecting the Japanese counterattacks on the flanks and then a head-on amphibious invasion on Lunga Point. So he left his rear undefended. He had some outposts there, and he had active patrol, and it would cover that. But he didn't have enough troops to do a 360 perimeter. 
with the introduction of the seventh Marines, what that gave Vandegrift, one, it gave him a, a chance to have a 360 degree perimeter, which would give him about a 15 mile perimeter. Plus it also gave him a chance to have uh, a bit of a mobile striking arm, more of a, what we call an active defense. So what he wanted to do was still control that airfield, but he wanted to go out and do limited offenses to push the Japanese back. Cause there's a, there's a river probably about eight, nine miles away called the Matanikau river. And Matanikau was a very strategic uh, area of Guadalcanal. So he wanted to keep the Japanese on the other side of the Matanikau river. And that's to the, the West to give a buffer zone to the airfield. And you'll find out later in the campaign when the Japanese landed heavy artillery, they moved their heavy artillery up. And plus they wanted to move tanks up too, but that Matanikau was a very strategic point throughout the whole campaign. So, but when the seventh Marines landed, it gave him that real um, chance to do that perimeter and also to, to push out and do some limited offensive, which as soon as they landed, they landed on the 18th, you know, by the 23rd, they're on the offensive. They had, he had pullers first battalion, seven Marines and the, and the first Marine Raiders, which is his two best units, most highly trained units. He had them already uh, doing a, a reconnaissance and force and pushing to the Metanica. But Barcelona was not involved in his first action. He was back at the perimeter because what they did was when they came in the seventh Marines, Edson's Ridge or Bloody Ridge, um, they the seventh Marines took over that sector, the southern sector line. They started digging in, uh, started digging in bunkers and laying wire and things like that. And and because Barcelona was in heavy machine guns, they stay because you you can't take a heavy machine. You can take a lot of machine guns, but you you know that's what I did, Marines. Um, you know when I got out, I was a, I was a heavy machine gun. Uh, platoon sergeant. So I know exactly. And, and machine guns hadn't changed. 50 cal then is 50 cal now. He hadn't changed. But you're not going to carry that thing around too much because, you know, with the tripod and, you know, then you got a water carrier, then you got ammo. Then, oh, you know, you got to break it down. But you put it back together. You know, I think one of those things weighed about 100 pounds. And then the receiver, something like 40 or 50 pounds of dead weight. So you're not going to be humping that thing too much through the thick jungle. So he remained back. Uh, he missed. He missed out on that one. And, and which later morphed into the 27th of September, which is probably the only defeat the U.S. Marines have. You've been to Guadalcanal. I, I, you know, I, was, I was intrigued, having recently watched, uh, when I talked to Henry Sledge, we recently watched all the Pacific and, and uh, after initially, I didn't like it when it first came out. I really enjoyed it second time through, however it is, you know, 12 years later. Um, well, I, was, I was intrigued by, you know, when, when, they're, when, when we're thinking about, them fighting there when we think about them digging uh emplacements you visited the island <laughs> it, when, when we're when we're imagining what it might be like do, do these do they does like the pacific do, what's it like what what is the geography and the you know the, the, the climate like is it as heavy and difficult uh, or, uh, as they might portray or are they not even the words to describe it <laughs> And if you compare it to the Pacific series with the, the terrain, say, for example, Alligator Creek, um, that's pretty much spot on. They, they, they got that quite well because pre-war, the area, especially in that area where the majority of fighting was at, was coconut plantations. That was a British protector, the Solomon Island British protector. And he had the, the Lever Brothers, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, but they were the co- they owned coconut plantations and you know, they had the copra. And, and all that. So vast plantation. So you had the nice planted uh, coconut trees and nice roads and, you know, it was all nice and cleared out. So you have a lot of that. And then you get to the natural plains. It's the kunai grass, which can grow very high. And, you know, it's, it, it's kind of razor sharp and you can walk through it. It won't cut you, but if you grab it and pull it, it will cut you. But then you have the, the coral ridges and it's like you see uh, the thin red line in the, in the fighting sequences in the new movie, the thin red line. They, they have it pretty much spot on. In the movie, The Thin Red Line, parts of that was actually filmed at Guadalcanal, but not the fighting parts. It was filmed in, in, in Queensland, in, in Australia. But if you go to my YouTube site, there's a, the Charles Davis Medal of Honor and, and the, the, the Galloping Horse. You know, that's probably the most preserved battlefield on Guadalcanal, and you look and you can see the terrain. But the, the, the ridge lines are barren. And I was, I was told by someone years ago, and I, I tend to believe it because it's all coral. I mean, you can just dig down by about three or four inches. You hit you know, solid rock, rock or coral. So, you know, trees don't grow there. There's not much topsoil, you know, small plants and, and, and grass. But then if you look into the deep valleys, jungle valley, it's this thick jungle like you would think a, a very thick jungle was. Talk about the Barcelona uh, Medal of Honor incident. He was in 
and him and his his battalion was in thick jungle and i can guarantee in swampy jungle and it, i can guarantee to this day i mean i've probably walked it more than anyone i i know other than a local that lives there it's thick nasty jungle that you wouldn't want to spend one night in that place but that's that's the, the, the terrain they were they were fighting in the, the, the night he wins, you know, 24th of October, it's, it's 42, isn't it? He wins his, his Medal of Honour. Um, that evening, what have they been set up to do? Are they expecting a fight? No, not really. So the 1st Battalion of 7th Marines, I mean, they'd had a, a bit of a hard, they were used quite a bit, you know, for that month proceeding. As soon as they hit the, you know, they hit the deck running, so to speak. So they were, um, had a lot of casualties. And, you know, at that stage, malaria started kicking in. So what they were going to give them a bit of a rest. So what the Japanese, this was the last Jap- Japanese had three large offenses in the water canal. So you had Alligator Creek, which they used basically a reinforced battalion. Then you had uh, Battle of Bloody Ridge, where they used a reinforced brigade. And then the Battle of Henderson Field, which was fought from the 23rd to the, the 26th. Well, some some say the 27th, you could say. But 23rd to 27th of October 42 was a reinforced division. So the second um, Sendai division in Japanese. So they had a pretty good plan. And at that stage, we're talking about the Matanikau River. So the Japanese had already um, brought in some heavy artillery, 100 millimeters and 150 millimeters, and they were pounding the airfield. And the Marines at that stage didn't have anything to counter battery fire. They had the 155s normally attached, but they left them in New Zealand when they shipped out to go to Guadalcanal very quickly because they didn't have enough. They weighed too much, so they had limited amount they could take. So they couldn't do counter-battery fire. So what the Japanese were going to do, at that stage, they had a company of tanks already landed on the island, so they were going to, at the mouth of Matanikau, the Marines had uh, deployed two battalions forward to try to keep the Japanese um, away from the Matanikau. So what the Japanese were going to do, they're going to take a, a, a regiment with those tank company. And they had to coordinate all this. They were going to attack with a holding action at the mouth of Matanikau because that was where the Marines thought the Japanese were going to come. They knew the Japanese had tanks. And the only way across Matanikau, because it didn't have a bridge, I mean, it had a, a log bridge, but the only place you could put vehicle traffic was a sandbar. And they knew that's the only place you could, you, you could um, bring those tanks across. And the Japanese were, you know, making some fakes and, and demonstrations, you know, a week or two before that. So the Marines said, well, here they come. And they, they pre-registered all their artillery fire. So they had two four battalions there, and Japanese were to come and hold hold the Marines there. They were going to have go upstream in the Botanic Island and attack with a reinforced battalion and try to cut those two battalions off. But at the same time, the second Sendai division with three rifle regiments had cut a path. It's called the Muriyama Road. Muriyama was the um, division commander. They'd cut a path, and it was 30 miles long around Mount Austin and went south, deep into the jungle. And what they were going to do is, that will come up and hit from the south and, and basically replicate the, the September Bloody Ridge battle. They will come straight south, hit Bloody Ridge, and go straight into the airfield, which is only about 1,100 or 1,200 yards away from the airfield of Bloody Ridge. And they knew that was going to be lightly defended. And, and we found out it was because what you had the second battalion of the seven Marines and the first battalion of the seven Marines. At that stage, U.S. Army had landed. Many do we know the U.S. Army was even at Guadalcanal. In fact, it was more U.S. Army at Guadalcanal than were Marines, especially toward the end. I mean, that came in. The 1st Marine Division did the hard, uh, I guess, the hard lifting in the first three, two to three months. But the first U.S. Army unit to land was the 164th uh, National Guard unit. And they were a pretty good unit. They were made from uh, North and South Dakota guys, and they're pretty pretty tough farm boys, they used to, they used to call them. So they landed on the 13th of October. And then they, they sent them to the flank, and they were, they were guarding the flank, which didn't expect much action. So they had the two battalions of the Seth Marines on that, that southern flank. The Marines expecting all the attack on the Matanikau. That second battalion of the Seventh Marines, they said, oh, we've got the, our, our, our left flanks in the air, so to speak, with these two far battalions. So what they did a couple of days before, they pulled a whole battalion of the Seventh Marines, second battalion of the Seventh, out of that southern line and put them up on the ridge to protect that, that left flank far to far deployed battalion. But what that did, Puller's 1st Battalion, 7th Marines, then had to hold a two battalion front. So they extended his front 2,600 yards, so something like 20, 2,200 meters, from the Lunga River over Bloody Ridge into the jungle flat all the way to a place called Coffin Corner where they tied in with the, the U.S. Army guys. Puller only had about 500 effective 
Marines holding that 2.2 kilometer line. And the Japanese at that stage was going to hit it with approximately, you know, about 7,000 Japanese in a fixed point. Yeah. So it was a good plan. But unfortunately, like a lot of the plans, of the Japanese plans of Guadalcanal, you know, they underestimated the terrain. That southern unit just, they were building their road. It was more like a track. And, you know, they were supposed to man carry their um, artillery. You know, every private was, or every soldier was given a 75 millimeter artillery round which to this day, if you go over the, the track where they walk, you'll still find 75 millimeter artillery rounds for just threw them out of their pack. You know, and, and they abandoned most of their guns, especially their, their uh, mountain howard and things. But, you know, it took them a long time to even make it there, and they kept delaying the attack, delaying the attack, delaying the attack. It was supposed to happen on the, the 21st. But on the 23rd, you know, they delayed it or one night, then they were going to delay it another night. But the guys at the mouth of Tanakal didn't get the word, so to speak. You know, it's like the Marines said, there's always one guy that never gets the word. So the the tanks attacked and the um, infantry attacked. They took all the tanks out very quickly. And they, the poor infantry didn't even get a chance to attack because the Marines had pre-registered that whole area. They gave every every battery, which I think is four guns, they gave them a 50-yard strip to fire up and down they just went like a ladder up and down up and down they fired some like six thousand rounds and you know like four batteries or four battalions so they, they basically decimated a whole japanese regiment before they, and the tanks attacked piecemeal there's famous photos in guadalcanal it shows all the tanks in the line on the the river mouth so they took them out so that attack stopped and then the, the flank attack never happened it happened like two days later and the guys in the jungle were still stuck there so that was happened that was on the 23rd so finally, they got in position to attack on the night of the 24th and 25th after a big, heavy rain. And once again, instead of attacking three regiments, they were supposed to attack two regiments up or one regiment, uh, you know, in support to, to push through. The, the second Sendai Division was a very good unit. You know, they were a very highly trained unit. They were, they were rated very high. In fact, all the Japanese troops sent to Guadalcanal was their, their top class units, you know, the best they had. But when they attacked uh, the 24th, you know, about 11 o'clock, 10 o'clock at night, the, <clears throat> the Marines won seven. What they had done before, they took a platoon from every company with some of the headquarters guys and put them up on the ridge to fill the gap that, that, that the that battalion had when they left. At that stage, the Marines had fixed bunkers. They had bunkers um, with overhead coconut logs, with, with sandbags. And that was real thick jungle down in the, down in the jungle. They had about, you know, 75 to 100 yards, if that, cut out in front of the thick jungle. And, and they had built about a four-foot-tall uh, barbed wire fence and with double aprons of barbed wire. You know, that was the only obstacle they had to, to hopefully hold up the Japanese. And what they had done, you know, when you're sitting in machine guns, and in my video I show it too, where they set the machine guns in enfilade with grazing fire, you know, not straight on the side and, and they'd set up firing lanes. So what the, the firing lanes would do, they knew that the Japanese using the infiltration techniques, especially in that thick jungle at night where the Japanese loved to attack, they'd hit the path of least resistance, you know, and, and try to channel them. So what the Marines did, they cut 75 to 100 yard firing lanes into the jungle, knowing that when the Japanese would come out of that thick jungle at night, you know, looking for the, you know, a, an easier way. And they would, and they'd hit that um, firing lane. And the Marines had these machine guns with the, they're called the traverse and elevation. You, you put them on a, a tripod, then you can lock the machine gun in. And the only thing you have to do is just pull the trigger, and it's going to hit exactly where you, you know, you 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 had planned it. So they had it's basically a killing zone they'd set up. So Vandegrift, you know, a week before, had walked through that area, and he said, "This is like a mach- this is a machine gunner's paradise." And, and Puller, I was reading the unit reports. He said they were only thirty percent. Um, he thought they were only the the defenses were only thirty percent done, but um. There was a linear defense because, you know, it wasn't in-depth, so they didn't have enough guys to do an in-depth defense. But what they did, every avenue of approach, there was two main trails. There was one trail that goes in the coffin corner that it came up as a giant, is about a 2,600-yard long open grass field. I mean, it's about 250 yards wide. And they call it the bowling alley. That's what the, in the U.S. Army was in there, and they, and they hooked in with the Marines. And what they hooked in with the Marines was a jeep track or jeep trail. And on that Jeep trail, I mean, I've got all the fire support plans and everything for that, but the Jeep trail had two 37 millimeter anti tank guns, 37 millimeter anti tank guns on both sides, and they were loaded with canister shot. 
And he had 50 cal machine guns. He had 30 cal machine guns and he had, you know, normal BAR rifles and the normal rifles. And they're all that whole area were pre-registered with 105 millimeter, 75 millimeter artillery. Then you had the 81 millimeter, six millimeter mortar. So that was, they said a chicken couldn't live on it. Like they, they said for the US Civil War. But the other, that was the one going into to, to call from corner Jeep trail. The another one was where Barcelona was at the mill of C company. So Barcelona was in D company, which was heavy guns, but, or heavy weapons, which is 81 millimeters and heavy machine guns. So what they did in those days, just like nowadays, they take um, those guys from heavy weapons company and just farm them out in support to all the rifle companies. So he was always attached to C company, which is a rifle company um, in this time on Guadalcanal. So, but they had, they were guarding a primary avenue of approach. It was called the Sector 3 Trail. So Sector 3 was an area that was a designated defensive area. So they knew the Japanese would probably, it was out of that thick jungle, would come up that track, that trail. So what they did was they had one 37-millimeter gun covering that that trail. There's a famous photo. Um, I can't pronounce this. I'll, I'll butcher my French. Cheval de Frise. Cheval de Frise. It's, a, it's an obstacle that you, you see in the U.S. Civil War, they made them. They probably go back from Middle Ages. So what? it's like a log. Big log in the middle with spikes sticking up through it. They had one of them as a gate because what they used to do, they, that the patrols would go out that gate every day and do patrolling. And they also had a Marines had a, about a, a thousand yards in front of the line. They had an outpost called Briggs Outpost to this day. They had a combat outpost of 40 something Marines up there. And they were supposed to be the, the tripwire, you know, the, 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 but Puller didn't want them out there, but the regimental commander overruled him and the division commander said, keep them out there. And you'll see if you watch the Pacific series is you know a guy called ralph briggs who had to be the platoon sergeant at the time got on the phone and he says you know japanese army he goes how many he said whole effing japanese army is coming past me he goes okay just go out there and go to left and try to work your way in so Barcelona was supporting this 37 and also covering that um vital uh, gate area which was the um one of the main avenues of approach knowing the japanese would probably hit that area which later they did they were so concerned about it i mean the, the um the, the C company uh, commander made him go out and put more barbed wire on, on that gate and more barbed wire um, tangle foot, they call it, stretching all everywhere to, to reinforce their lines. But the, the Marines didn't know they were coming. They, they had a, a few, a couple of days before, there were some reports of um, they seen a Japanese officer with field glasses on one of the ridges looking at them. Then they had their scout snipers out and they seen some cooking fires up the river and they said, well, and what the Japanese had done, that's why they went so deep into the jungle. The air cover couldn't see them. And what was more important, the Solomon Island scouts, you know, the local scouts they had working for the Marines and the Coast Watchers, they didn't pick them up either. So that's why the Marines didn't think, you know, they're coming. So that night when the Japanese hit, uh, what's it like for Barcelona and his, I mean, how, how big is the section, section, sections? How many sections is, is he in command of? Maybe we can after we discuss what happened there. We can talk about the the you know the, the Sergeant John Barcelona, the Marine versus you know Manila John, the legend. And there's a lot of um, inconsistencies and confusion uh, accounts of it as a Medal of Honor. He did amazing amazing things, but as you know, with legends, a lot of these amazing uh, tales get very super amazing, and you know that you think superhuman that people can't do, but. Sometimes when people make a lot of mistakes when they're talking about Barcelona, and even in his Medal of Honor citation it actually says uh, two machine gun sections. And some people read that as two machine guns. But a machine gun section at the time was two squads. So that's four heavy machine guns. So each squad had two heavy machine guns in it. So it's four heavy machine guns. And in the strength on paper is 18 men. One section leader, which is a sergeant, he commanded – on paper, 16 men and four heavy machine guns. But in reality, he had four heavy machine guns and 14 men, so they were too short. And what, what Barcelona had done, he didn't have all these four of these machine guns in one bunker because it would be a bit confused or tight. So what he did was he had two bunkers with two machine guns in each bunker, right, and set an enfilade. And in Barcelona's statement, everything, like I said, well, he, he, they really drilled down on – once he gives it, then the, the officers really drill down on information, and he says his bunkers – Two bunkers was 30 yards apart. So they were 30 yards apart. And he was in the far left, in the left bunker. And his other um, section was in the right bunker. She had seven, him and seven guys are in the left and seven guys are in the right. So they were commanded probably by a corporal. Each squad was commanded by a corporal. 
each squad had two heavy machine guns. So sometimes that's one of the confusions in the Barcelona story. They thought you had two heavy machine guns only. Uh, I, I, I have sort of two questions here. What, 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 you know, what it does Barcelona win his medal of honor for? I, 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 perhaps you could try and sort of say, what, what, what do we know and what do we not know? And what has been written about that we don't know that we don't know? <laughs> so, <laughs> Because as, as you say, oddly enough, compared to Iwo Jima, my assumption is that at Guadalcanal we have a, a much better idea of what Barcelona does because he is there to report it afterwards. Whereas uh, you know, the reports from Iwo Jima, Barcelona is not there to report on what he did. So the reports are extremely mixed. As you said, that's very peculiar. But Guadalcanal, what, 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 what did he do? What do we know he did? Uh, and wh- where are our areas of discrepancy? So, yeah, this is, I guess, the meat of it um, with, the, with the legend of Barcelona. Like I stated before, I've, I've, I've walked the field. I was there. I've lived there for three years. I only left there in 2020. And that was one of my goals was actually to to lock down every Medal of Honor and just find out more because I had the opportunity to walk these battlefields to actually go where, you know, um, a lot of people has never been before and really delve very, very deep in it. I had the, the time, you know, as a military history, nothing former Marine, of course I'm going to jump into it. And, you know, I, when I was joining the Marines or even before the Marines, I, you know, I was reading military history, you read about these guys and you tend to believe everything you read. And then once you experience a bit of it and, and then you go, oh, hold on, let me just, this doesn't seem right. Let me just do some more research. So, uh, I went about trying to um, take an objective look, you know, and um, and just see what I could find. And, and I'll just say this is a disclaimer right now. And what I did find with Barcelona is quite amazing. I mean, before it was been amplified, blown out of proportion a bit. I mean, what he's done, he, he more than more than you know. I'm not, don't get me wrong. He more than more than anything deserved the the medal. What he did was quite amazing. So I've walked this area. It's a very thick area. Not too many people go into it. And there was a, an Australian expat. He's unfortunately uh, deceased now. He was, his name's John Ennis. John Ennis lived on Guadalcanal for over 20-something years. He worked there. So John had the benefit. You know, he, um, he took a lot of people on tours, you know, like I did. But John had the benefit, especially of these veterans coming back, you know, and he was getting his firsthand information. He would walk, and the veterans would walk, and he'd walk with them and they'd tell their stories and, you know, he'd assist them a lot of times and refining their positions and things like that. And, and, and a lot of, to this day, parts of Guadalcanal are so preserved. I mean, you can actually see foxholes and you can take a veteran straight to his foxhole and he goes, yeah, I was there. That was my foxhole. John had retired. So the first time I went there was 2009. You know, I was, I was there for a four month period then. And, and John would come over and from Australia and do week long battlefield tours. So I spent a whole week with John kind of one-on-one. And, and we went into the Barcelona area and, and I asked John, I said, he says, this is the Barcelona area. I said, well, how do you know? He said, look, I'm about 70, 80 percent sure this, this, these two holes is his holes. He said, but I don't know for sure. He says, in all the years I've here, been here, I never really had the time like I really wanted to, to, to delve deep into this. I said, I'd really like to. And he goes, that's, that's your mission. That's your job. So I took it upon myself to, to find out. So I went through the, the testimony straight from Barcelona. Um, I've been through the unit records, all the unit reports from the 7th Marines. I've actually spoke to veterans who was there. In fact, even six weeks ago, this is quite amazing. I came across a 97-year-old veteran. He was one of the, the gunners of the 37 millimeter of C Company. He told me his name, and I actually had the, the mud map that one of the veterans drove, and he's on the gun crew. His name's George Mason. And, that, and he's 97 years old, and he, he's just like it happened yesterday to him. You know, he, he was going through the nomenclature, the guns, tell me. So I spoke to him. I've read all the memoirs from the guys who was there. I spoke to another veteran um, who was there, who was in the Army. And then walking the ground and comparing the notes and looking at it objectively and, and knowing what I know about, you know, machine guns and, 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 and tactics. So that with all that in my head, you know, and comparing it to the, the information over the years. So basically what happened was Barcelona was in the far left bunker with his two machine guns. So the Japanese first had started attacking the A company lines at Coffin Corner, and he could hear it because, first off, he was tied into the, the field phone lines, outpost lines. So all the, the guys were tied onto it. As soon as he get on it, he click it, he could hear it, and he, he picked it up. And that was when Ralph Briggs, the outpost, was says, look, they're coming, they're coming. So they knew they were coming. They were waiting on them. And it, it, it was a, a big rainstorm right before that, but it just 
you know, and, and in the Pacific series, they got that, that part quite well, you know, with the basketball, it shows the rain and it stops and it was, and they were waiting. Um, but they were in enclosed covered bunkers in the Pacific series. You know, they had the bunkers open, I guess, you know, you have to see the star anyway. And that's why you didn't have a, you, have to see what, you know, it's just all black and run around and go, what, the, you know, so obviously you have to Hollywood a bit. So, but in it, he's in an enclosed bunker. And he said, as soon as he's put the field phone down, they automatically engaged on the left flank. So they pulled the guns all the way, swerving it to the left, and was engaging and trying to assist some of the A company. So remember, they were covering this this uh, line in the uh, this trail in the line, this main avenue approach. So the Japanese read the Japanese reports. Yeah, they engaged to the far right. Initially, they were supposed to go over Bloody Ridge, but then the jungle actually pushed them. You know, and they only can attack in piecemeal. You know, they had like seven thousand guys there, but they only attacked in platoon and company size, right? And they ran straight up a track, right up a trail. You know, it's the Japanese. And they're, you know, they're very centralized thinking in their tactics. They try to infiltrate, but if they can't infiltrate, they'll just go straight. They, you know, their last orders was attack down this trail, and they'll to the man. They'll t- keep attacking to that trail until there's no one to attack. And while speaking to the 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 vet uh, last. Um, month he said look he, he was man in the 37 he was actually the gunner and he said he never fired it at night in training he said the first 37 um, millimeter blast he let loose he said he well i won't tell you exactly what he said but he said he thought the thing blew up he said they got within 30 yards of him they, he said they were just kept coming yet he, he said you had to kill them all they just kept coming you can imagine his 17 year old kid in a bunker but that's when they first engaged to the left he didn't give it really a time frame, but it's probably, you know, I'd say 30 or 40 minutes. And then had a runner come in and told him that his far right section was only 30 yards away. And you read some accounts, you know, they're, you know, he ran 100 and 200 yards. You know, they're only 30 yards away because once again, why would you put your other machine gun 200 yards away? They're going to right beside you where they were fixed. So he came in and said the other, other bunker had been taken out. They had some killed and wounded and the guns were, um, what do you say, busted. That was his exact words. He said, they, they, he was told me the guns were busted. So what he did was he took two Marines from that, that section of seven and he grabbed the machine gun. When he grabbed the machine gun, he said he spread legal it on the back with a tripod. So, and that's another fallacy that, you know, he, he had a heavy machine gun and he fired it from the hip. There was no tripod on it. No, he had a tripod. He had a low mounted tripod. So what we've gathered is he didn't mention it in here, but he normally with the, the heavy machine guns are high mounted. You had to sit behind them, but to lower them down, there was a 1919 light machine gun. So the tripod fit the same. So that, and there's pictures that we found that uh, sometimes if they wanted to lower the, 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 the heavy gun down, they'd put them in a low mount tripod. So he had a low mount tripod because he mentions it later that the, the mounts were so low. That's been backed up by a number of sources that said he had a tripod. And even he himself, he said a tripod and he said it weighed a hundred pounds. So he threw it spread eagle on his back and went with, with those guys. They went back about 40 yards to the supply trail that had parallel to all the bunkers. Then they had to run down about 30 yards and back up to go to the other bunker. But he said, in the meantime, we ran into eight Japanese. I tend to believe the report he gives to two Marine officers when he's been formally interviewed than he does to newspaper reporters. A lot of this information that Bassan is given, you know, he, he, he's given it to, to friends and families and things and, you know, when it gets told and retold all through the years, and it's, sometimes it gets kind of blown out of proportion or distort, disjointed and distorted. It's kind of an assumption that if he's reporting it to the military, that, that they might actually double check it, so that he's much less likely to uh, deviate from from what he believes to be the truth. Especially two marine officers, and you know he's a, he's a professional NCO, and and it's more like a formal interview with him. So he's you know he's, you know they know they can check out his, his story. So I, I tend to believe that one more than any of them. But he basically says he. They ran into eight Japanese and we took care of them. Now, he didn't go into detail how he took care of them. And I read in another source, that's where he fired the machine gun. But him firing the machine gun, he had to fire it with a tripod still on, which would he'd, he'd have to cradle it in his arm and the, trop, the low tripod still there and he had to fire it. That means he had a 250 round belt still in it. So, and he mentions he had a water jacket on it too because he didn't have water in it. But anyway, between him and his two other guys that he took over, um, what was the names? Powell, Powell and Garland, two privates. He took those two over with him. So they had their arm with pistols and rifles. So they, they said, we took care of the eight Japanese. So anyway, they made it to the other bunker. When they made it to the other bunker, there were only two Marines still there out of the seven. He said the killed and, and the wounded already been taken back. So I, that was something in, I'm trying to find out because that means there's a bit of a time there. 
that they actually took time to move the dead out. Cause normally, you know, in the middle of all this fight, the Japanese are running past them. They'd leave the dead. But anyway, they had, they had three dead and two wounded. When they got there, the two privates, one was named Evan and one was named Crumpton. Apparently Evans was screaming at the top of his lungs, yelling at the Japanese, cursing at them and firing his rifle. He's a wild man. And Barcelona got there. He says, I'm, I'm, uh, as soon as I got there, I automatically laid the gun that he was carrying straight on the flat ground, right, right beside the bunker. Then I had to go fix the stoppage. And they actually asked him, what was the stoppage? What actually was the stoppage in the gun? So he said he rode into the bunker. And look, one of the guns was taken out. So it looked like been hit by a grenade. But the other gun, he said, was only a, a ruptured shell. So sometimes we're firing the, the machine guns and a uh, shell would actually rupture and splinter and stick into the chamber. So you have to pull it out. And they get this right in the in the Pacific series. So you see him in the Pacific series, he goes underneath and he sticks a knife or something. And he pulls it and it pops and it chambers around and he gets it going. So they said, he said, probably the, the crew got a bit excited before and, and couldn't clear the, the stoppage. But he, you know, Barcelona was a professional machine gunner. So he'd been doing these for years and he could do it. You know, he used to do it blindfolded and have competitions and make his guys do blindfolded. So he cleared it. And they said, how long did it take you to clear? It's less than a minute. So he started firing that machine gun. So, and they said, what would you do? He said, I would fire one. He said, and they asked him how, how far apart was the guns? He said, they were two feet apart. He said, I would fire one, roll over to the other one, load it and fire it. Cause I asked him, he said, you load it? He goes, yeah, I loaded it myself. He'd load it and fire it, roll over it, load it and fire it. He said, what was the other guys doing? He said, they were standing to the sides of the bunker firing their rifles and pistols. And he says, um, I had a 45 pistol. And it's quite once he once I read that in his statement, there's a photos of Baslan when he goes on his war bonds tour and he's he's got him there in a low mount gun. He's got a 45 laying on the ground beside him. He's just he's he's just showing something. I said, Well, he's he's you know, he's he's um recreating the incident. So he had a 45 and it was all muddy. He had a 45 laying on the ground. They said every time a Japanese would run behind him and get behind the bunker, because they had a big door in a bunker, said he'd pick the 45 up and shoot the Japanese and jump back on the gun. So he kept doing that, rolling back and forth. What happened was the Japanese, it was the ninth company, the ninth company of the um, what company, what battalion, third battalion of the 29th regiment. They were the first guys to attack. Very good regiment. But the ninth company was, the, they, they went almost um, in columns straight up that, that track until they hit the barbed wire. As soon as they hit the barbed wire, then, you know, Barcelona was just, was, his machine guns was taking them out. And he basically, that's probably about five minutes, five to 10 minutes. He basically decimated the whole company of roughly a hundred plus men. He was credited with, with um, killing 38 because that was, he, they found 38 dead Japanese in, between his bunker and the wire. Cause I asked him how far the wire was. And then everyone on the ground and um, I've walked this line and I've walked out and it was roughly about 30 feet. He said, oh, the, the bob wire line was 30, about 30 feet away from my bunker. And he said, I could see about another 25 feet on the other side. So what they would do, the Japanese, they were just hopefully holding them up on that thick barbed wire line, and then yeah, and then they could take them out. And that that Cheval de Free, probably really butchering that, really held them up. They they couldn't get past that. But he said the Japanese had uh, like homemade Bangalore torpedoes. He said they had dynamite. He kept calling it dynamite on sticks, and he said they kept shoving it under the wire, trying to blast it. He said and they were throwing dynamite over the wire at his bunker because he was a bit concussed, suffered from concussion. And he said they're trying to hit the 60 millimeter mortars. And I, as soon as I read that, I thought, well, geez, a 60 millimeter must be very close. He said they're throwing them over their bunker. Because you got to remember, the Marines had a linear line. And, and, and the Japanese, some of the Japanese were getting past them. They were like dribs and drabs going past them into the thick jungle. But the Basson, he's fired it back and forth, back and forth. And this started about one o'clock in the morning. So he's rolling back, back and forth, back and forth. And they asked him, they said, well, how many bullets did you have? He said, each, each gun had a unit of fire. So a unit of fire for a heavy machine gun was 126 belts of 250 rounds. So about 30,000 rounds, each gun. And so he had four guns. So they were running out of ammunition. And in some reports, you said, oh, you can completely run out of ammunition. And this, this is another thing that it just brings a lot of credibility to this. Because he says, no, I didn't completely run out of ammunition. I had to go back and get more ammunition. They said, so you were completely run out. He goes, no, I had, I had four belts left. They said, well, you weren't out of ammunition. And you could see he was a bit like the two officers, like, oh, are you kidding me? He goes, I'm not going to leave it completely dry. He says, for the guys, he says, by the time it took me to go back and get more ammunition, at least they had some ammunition 
they weren't completely out. You know, they, I left from four belts. They could, you know, fire it for emergency reasons. So anyway, what's, what he'd done, this is, this is a, the real amazing part of the story. He had to go back and get ammunition at ammo points, about, about 150 yards back. And I found that ammo point. She had to go 150 yards back. So you got to remember, thousands of Japanese were running around these, or well, hundreds probably, not a thousand but at that stage, but, you know, it was mass confusion. Um, Marines in the bunkers firing forward, all these machine guns. What Bassalone had done, instead of going straight back to get the ammo, because he knew the Japanese were behind him, he's run out where the barbed wire line was, in front of all the bunkers, ran down the bunker line, in the middle of all, like, kind of like a no man's land, ran back into the Marine line. He'd crawl. Then he'd get to an open area, he'd run, then he'd crawl, and he, he went back and he got all this ammunition. And they said Basson was a pretty strong guy. And he didn't mention how many belts of ammo he got, but they said, you know, he threw belts of ammo on him. Sorry, he had boxes because he mentioned pushing boxes. So he wouldn't have belts, make sense, because they were coming boxes because there was all mud and stuff there. He wouldn't, he wouldn't jam up all his um, belts. So they were still in boxes. So I don't know, he probably had three or four boxes if that. Anyway, he's pulling all these boxes back. He said he would push them across the uh, the area and then it, it dragged but anyway he's made himself it took him they asked him how long did it take he said about 30 minutes so to go back and again remember japanese running around everywhere he mentioned anywhere that he took on any japanese in between that area or run into any japanese you know some of the other reports said you know he had a machete and a pistol and he was killing japanese left and right which he in his own admission he didn't do any of that then he's made it back to his bunker and reloaded the or put more ammunition in. And he said that the, um, the officers asked him, did the other guys fire when you were away? He goes, no, they didn't fire a machine gun at all. They're still shooting these. And, and another guy got wounded before that. So it only left him, him and um, three others in the bunker at that time. So one of the other, the two, the two original ones, one of them was actually wounded. And, and Evans got wounded too, so they moved those guys out. So it left him and the two guys he brought over. So it was only three of them then. So two on the sides and then Barcelona in the middle. And then Basson kept firing. They asked him, they said, did you fire continuously? He goes, no, no. He goes, sometimes it, it was every five minutes, they'd, they'd rush, every 10 minutes, and sometimes it was 30 minutes. Well, I was going to say, it's an ebb and flow, isn't it? It's easy to think that for hours and hours, it's, people keep coming. Presumably, this is a constant ebb and flow of quiet, and it's all on, and then steadies off. And Yeah, so, yeah, so it was it's like dribs and drabs, so to speak, because you know, one company would go in, and they'd get kind of hit hard and a, you know, a squad would go in and a platoon would go in. So they're just, they're funneling them, channeling them. And they kept firing it until daylight. And he says at daylight, they expected the Japanese to do one mass rush, but they didn't. So they asked him, they said, did you fire continuously? Like when, you know, he goes, sometimes I would fire long burst, but you know, most guys are trained in and, and they do or now and then they'd fire, you know, short burst, five, six, seven rounds at a time. And it's more accurate. You're not burning your barrels out. Their guns are running red hot. So he, he, burnt a couple of his barrels out so to speak and he burnt himself changing barrels he said they asked, asked, they asked him too how many rounds did you fire in your pistol he said i'll have one bullet left at the end of the, when the morning time comes so he only fired if it was fully loaded he finally fired about he had a 45 so he fired six bullets some of the fallacies on that uh, that i come across all the time uh, one of the fallacies i read is only Barcelona and two others survived i think people get that from Yes, only not survive, but the Barcelona had two guys that he initially took over to the other bunker. So he had basically three killed in action and five wounded in his section of 14 guys. So 30 meters away was a whole section of, of, of at that stage, five other guys. It was untouched, you know, thir- only 30, 30 yards away, sorry, of his section. So, you know, and it makes it look like him and only two guys were left in the whole line. I mean, there was 500 Marines there. There was guys left and right. There was a 37 millimeter gun you know, not too far from him, you know, another 50, 60 yards, you know, there were, there were riflemen, you know, to his right and left or Mortimer right behind him. So there was, you know, he didn't, he didn't hold the position by himself. This was the one that always comes up for some reason. Barcelona was awake continuously for three days firing. There was a private that's always quoted. They said, oh, and this one private, I, mean, I don't know when he gave him later in life. And he goes, yeah, you know, Barcelona was on the go for three days, continuously firing with no sleep. And he, you know, he was fighting out. And when he ran out of ammo, he used a machete and a pistol. And if you, and another one that Barcelona single handedly wiped out a regiment of two to 3,000 Japanese, you know, and you don't have to be a, like a military scholar, use a bit of common sense that one man can't kill 3,000 other men. You, know, you got to use a bit of common sense. Another thing you see that he fought on a hill. Sometimes he quite, he's, he's on a hill or a ridge. Even even Robert Leckie, 
when he wrote his book, Robert Lecky, as you know, from Helmet from a Pillow, but he, he later wrote a book called um, Challenge for the Pacific about the Battle of Guadalcanal, like a history. And he mentions that Barcelona was on a hill or slight rise. And in Barcelona, in his statement, and and you could see the I've got the where the units were, and and that's thick, flat jungle. They were in a flat area. They wasn't on the, on top of the, the ridge. Uh, B Company was on the ridge. He was in C Company. C Company was nowhere near the ridge. And he is on a mission. They were in the, the jungle flat. He, he tells these two marine officers in the jungle flat. <clears throat> Another thing you'll see how they had to run out and push bodies off. The bodies did stack, but what Bastion said he did, he just moved his gun around. That makes more sense. I mean, why would you run all the way out with all those Japanese, you know, and, and moving bodies out? And they said at one stage, the Japanese were actually using the bodies as cover. They had a Japanese machine gun on the other side because they were not so much they were stacking on top of each other. They were hitting a bob wire, and a bob wire was stacking them up. Vaston said he had the low mounts, low tripod mounts on his machine guns, so he couldn't get, get it elevated high enough to, to engage them. So what he would do, he didn't state how far he moved out left, or probably wasn't that, that far, but he moved out so he could have a clear field of fire left and right. So he moved the gun instead of moving forward and running out and trying to pull body or sending one of his men out to do it. That made a lot more sense when I read that. He was, oh, I moved my gun. I didn't, you know, he didn't particularly say he moved the bodies, but he didn't mention anything. You would think he would mention that. But that's that's in a lot of uh, reports. So in the morning time came, the battalion commander, which was Puller, uh, he walked through and he seen uh, the area in front of uh, Barcelona's bunker. And the only thing he said to Barcelona and, and you know, and I've read this in, in Puller stuff, and I've read it in Barcelona. He, he said, good job. So he looked at me, he looked around and said, good job. Because there was hundreds of them on the other side of the wire, wire apparently. So that was, the, <clears throat> that was the first night. You know, the main assault happened the next night, but Barcelona wasn't involved in that. So what happened? About 3 o'clock that morning, <clears throat> this was quite unique, the U.S. Army, had, like I said, had arrived. And the, the only reserve they had for the whole campaign or – the division at the time was the third battalion of the 164th regiment of the U.S. Army. They had to move those guys in. So what they did was they put them single file. He sent the battalion Padre back to lead them in, and they led them in, and they sent guides from every platoon. They had the, that supply trail, and they they put one army guy in a hole with each marine. And the army had the M1 Grands at the time. The Marines had the old three Springfield. <clears throat> so the one of the captains up on the ridge said that as soon as the army got inserted, he could hear the volume of fire increase with those grants. You know, that was a typical pull-up when battalion commander of the army was Lieutenant Colonel Hall. And when he met him in the middle of all this, and, and typical pullers, but his command post was 50 yards behind the line. It's only 50 yards behind. And he walks up there and he says, he goes, look, <clears throat> I don't know who's seen you here. He says, but this is my show right now. And I'm going to be in charge if you don't mind. He goes, yeah, Fill your boots. You're in charge. Go ahead, buddy. Morning time came, and they know the Japanese weren't attacking anymore. They consolidated and moved the Barcelona and the rest of the battalion up on the ridge to join the, the small unit they had up there. And then that third battalion of the U.S. Army had moved in, took over the where the um, first battalion, Seventh Marines were. And Barcelona, he said, "Yeah, we went up on the ridge then." And they said, "Oh, you're engaged." The next night, he goes, "No." He said, "They fired a few mortars at us, but you know, we didn't we didn't copy anything." But down the line at Coffin Corner, is where the main Japanese assault came um, that night, and they they tried to go for that jeep trail. And then between the thirty, the, the U.S. Army and the, and the weapons companies from the Marines, they just decimated those guys, and that's why it's called Coffin Corner. I think one of the Marines said, if he was a, a coffin maker, he'd be a millionaire. And the Japanese, I think. In those two days of attacks, they lost about 2,500 guys they know dead just for that alone. That was the scene of the largest Japanese attack in the Guadalcanal campaign and one of the last Japanese real offensive attacks uh, of the war. I think they did one more. If you don't count China, Burma, India, I think they did one more in, in Bougainville the next year. Well, they're actually not a bonsai attack. You no, know, bonsai attacks come the last ditch ever, but this is like a coordinated offensive because Japanese are on the offensive. So who put Barcelona forward for the – Medal of Honor. If if Puller's just going, good job. <laughs> no, it was typical Puller. Puller Puller put him in for the medal. He um the, he see what he did, and he obviously other guys were on the line too. There was another machine gunner. He had some end up dying. I forgot his name. He was a another heavy machine gun gunner in C Company, not too far from Barcelona. And he held off a lot too, and he died by dynamite in a bunker. But what Barcelona did, and what was so amazing about what Barcelona done, he he was covering that vital track, that trail which is, a, you know, if the Japanese would have penetrated that track, you know, they, they could have put a few hundred and they would have, you know, 
there would have been in, on the airfield, the Marines really had to deal with that then. But so he, he and it was his, his will, his professionalism about being a great machine gunner, a good professional machine gun, Marine NCO machine gunner, that he was able to get those machine guns going, you know, when the bunkers was taken out. You know, he had some junior Marines there. He stepped up and got it done. He he held it, held that part of the line, that small part of the line, that, that bottle line. So Puller recognized that. And he seen what he had done. He basically wiped out a, a company, you know, probably around, I'd say, 150, 200 guys, his machine guns, his two machine guns, and the one machine gun he'd left on the left bunker, you know, taken out. And that 37 millimeter had taken out a few guys. So he put him in for the medal. And Barcelona, at that stage, was the first Marine enlisted to be put in for the medal on Guadalcanal. I mean, there was another one and during a making raid. I don't know when he, he actually died uh, posthumously. What was interesting, the next night, about five miles away, on a place called Cola Ridge, uh, Mitchell Page, he was in 2-7. He was the exact same thing Barcelona was, right? He was a section um, uh, leader, overhead machine gun, and he basically did the same thing Barcelona did. If you look at his actions really in detail, Page did fire the, the gun from the hill. Page held a portion of the ridge by himself. His crews was killed and wounded, and, and the infantry company he was supported actually run down a hill and tried to went to retrograde to another position. He got so mad at him, he grabbed his rifle and started firing at him at one stage, and he, he was left on the hill by himself. He was running from gun to gun. And In fact, at one stage in the battle, all the Japanese fire was on him, on a little knoll. Page is knoll. If you go there today, you'll see. It's just, you know, he was basically surrounded. And he actually led a counterattack down the hill carrying that, that, that gun. Why is Page kind of overshadowed by Barcelona? It was the night before, or the night before. Um, and then they didn't know they were getting the medal until they got to Australia. So they let, when they left in December, in January of, of 42 and 43, they went to, uh, you know, R&R in Australia. You know, it's famously depicted in the, in the Pacific Series. At that stage, Page had been given a battlefield commission. So he was a lieutenant. Uh, another interesting fact a lot of people don't know that Barcelona was offered a battlefield commission. He turned it down. He re- wanted to remain a sergeant. Um, he was a sergeant there. He wasn't a platoon sergeant at that stage. He was a sergeant. So Barcelona became, the at that stage, the, the only living uh, Marine enlisted person, a man, to, to have the medal. You know, he was one of the first ones in the war. So, you know, he was there in Australia. Then the powers to be said, look, we need to raise war bonds. So they looked and see the other medal monitor. We had Vandergriff and Edson, who were older officers. Then you just had Page, who was an older married guy, and he just became an officer. But you had this one young, uh, a good-looking single Marine NCO who was like a poster poster Marine, and the the feat he did was quite amazing. And they said, "Well, we want this guy. We're going to put him on a war bonds tour." You know, so he was given orders from Australia to go. And he initially said, no, I don't want to go. You know, I'm just a, you know, I'm, I'm a machine gunner and I'm going to stay here with my guys. That's what I do. And they go, oh, you don't have a choice. You, the war efforts more, you're more important in the States than you are training machine guns. So they put him on a war bonds tour. And once again, in the Pacific series, you, know, you say he's famously, you know, I didn't say, I wouldn't think he wouldn't enjoy it, but, you know, knowing a professional Marine NCO he was, I mean, he'd probably, thought it was something funny at the beginning and fun, but then later he would have, you know, and it, if you read reports, you know, then later on in the war bonds tour, he just wanted to go back and be with his Marines, you know, cause that wasn't his life, but they, they, they made him like a, he was a mass celebrity. So you look at, look at the uh, newsreel films in the forties and he was probably one of the most recognized m- uh, men in America at the time in 43. So he was on a war bonds tour with, with, with movie stars and you see him, the mayor of New York and everybody's, he's, he's you know, they gave him the keys of the city, and he was a, he was a he was a rock star basically, a rock star status. He was a celebrity, and, and he was living that life. He was such a famous guy, you know. Then his obviously the legend started growing about Barcelona, the, the legend of Barcelona. Once again, then Barcelona, he, he got a bit tired of it, and he just he said, "Look, you know, I just I don't want to do this anymore." And they said, "Oh, we'll make you a trainer." You know, they offered him a commission again. He goes, no, I don't want to do it. They said, well, we'll make you a trainer. You know, we don't want to see you back in combat. What do you want to go to combat for? You're a hero. You know, you'd, you know, your loss would be a major blow to the, the morale. And he goes, look, he, he goes, I'm a Marine in Seattle. I got to be with my boys. You know, you know, they're all there fighting. I feel guilty. I need to be with them. Finally, he had to go, he had to go to the um, Commandant of the Marine Corps, which is Vandegrift at that time, his old division commander, and, and basically plead his case. And once again, you know, the Marine NCOs and professional Marines, they said, well, this guy wants to fight, you know, send him back to fight. 
And that's another reason why Barcelona's a legend and, and he's such a mire to this day that, you know, he didn't have to go. He didn't have to go back, but he went back and he wanted to be with his men. He says, my, I can train these guys. I can keep them alive. I'm going back. In many respects, is the reason why you don't send Medal of Honor winners back because, because uh... yeah, it was a major blow to morale when he when he died. You know, because it was some, the, you know at that stage he was the the poster he was the poster guy of the Marine. I don't think I, I don't not sure how many Medal of Honor winners go back after winning back to combat. They do try to keep them away from direct combat. They might send them back to combat area because it's all, but they're, they're not in in. in directly in, in the face of danger. Sometimes they go back, you know, they, they do another war. Like you have a war to, you earned it more to, you see me career Vietnam. But once again, they, they don't want to do that because it's, it's bad for morale. But yeah, that's, that's the, you know, the, the legend, the legend of Manila, Manila John. So Manila John was his a nickname he was given. I think it was given in when he was over in the uh, Philippines in, in uh, Manila John. So, you know, obviously he went back. And he went to the 5th Marine Division, the 27th Regiment. And on the 19th of February in the Battle of Iwo Jima, you know, he was um, leading from the front like he would, you know, taking care of the guys. You know, he's a combat veteran, you know, and like a Marine NCO officer did, especially those days, they you know, lead from the front. And apparently took out a, a bunker by himself, and he was, you know, getting a, getting a job done, so to speak. And on the first day of the invasion, then he was, you know, you still get controversy on how he was killed. You know, sometimes it was you hear he was hit by mortar round and died instantly, and then you know you hear other counts machine gun fire got him and he lived for a little bit and then he died. And, but he definitely died on the, the February the nineteenth. And yeah, that was a big, big because um, he was, obviously was famous uh, during his own time. But I, I, I think this is uh, <laughs> this is about you know it's where you get to that discussion of the legend, don't you? You know, clearly. We, much more is known about Guadalcanal, but you look at Iwo Jima and he's on top of the bunker. Or was he on top of the – was he blowing up the bunker or was he ordering someone to blow the bunker? Was he ordering tanks to – was he sat on tanks ordering tanks? Why would he be sat on tanks ordering tanks to do things? Why should they – there's so many – I don't know if they're inconsistencies, but they're almost like vignettes of stories that have been – uh, associated with him. And it's not to say any one of those things didn't happen, but was it him? Was it not him? Did he really do – every bit, bit bit of the story and it's fascinating as i say i was looking at the youtube not the youtube the wikipedia page before and it has everything associated it with, with him sort of put in a, a pithy paragraph saying look he did all this stuff and it makes it kind of unequivocal that he definitely did all these things where actually they can be very much nuanced and that comes back to this creation creation of a legend where he can't speak for himself and you see and once again you know it it really amplified his legend when he you know just like a rock star that dies young you know or a movie you know movie star dies young and he, he obviously died young at the prime of his his career so to speak doing doing what he does best um in, in World war ii i did wonder if did the navy had to make him make him a hero because he's a medal of honor winner you can't have him just die a pointless death so if you have a hero in a battlefield you know, he might have been doing you know, heroic things, but that you know, he gets the Navy Cross, doesn't he? Yeah, Navy Cross. He's the only enlisted Marine to get both the Medal of Honor and Navy Cross. Now, who knows? I mean, um, knowing Barcelona and, and knowing his, from what I've read about him, there's no doubt that you know he was leading from the front, especially as his platoon sergeant at that stage. And you know, that's when you have a high casual rate of officers and NCOs. I mean, especially on that first day when you got to get guys off the beach and they were getting hit pretty hard with artillery fire on that third wave and. You know, and, and it takes guys to jump up and go, like, follow me, you know, to get these guys. And a lot of them are, you know, green troops, you know, well-trained, but green troops. And you can imagine the, the, the hell of Iwo Jima and what they're hitting on the first day. But there's, there's no doubt that he jumped up and did those, you know, things. He probably took out a bunker. I mean, that was what his Medal of Honor – or, sorry, his Navy Cross Citation has. And then he, then he started getting things done and, and organizing, which was typical. I could see him organizing – um, parties to go and, and directing men to do that was that's his job get them off the beach and get them fighting his his exploits are amazing and then it's turned into legend but you know that's what that's what they needed at the time yeah exactly but it was fascinating when his family are writing about them and you think well his family are not, not necessarily first hand but what do they know that people who have said to them uh who knew him at the time in those places and his family writing as though they're almost writing in the first person 
but they don't know because you know just because their family doesn't mean it, they they know any better necessarily than anyone else. But because it's family, it's taken as gospel, and it's built on. It, it's a fascinating case study in sort of uh, of 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 public relations and legend building and motivation and so many other things surrounding the war about one guy doing a really good job. <laughs> Yeah, and then well, it was it was there. It was kind of used by the government, you know. They they still do it to this day. You know, they, you get a hero and they they pump him up a bit. And like my disclaimer I said at the beginning of the, the episode, I mean, what he did was was more than more than enough. There's no controversy on the, about Barcelona and Medal of Honor. He did amazing things. But you know, once again, a lot of things get blew out of proportion sometimes. Well, Dave, that seems like a a, a natural place to finish. Um, thanks, low listener. If you want to see Guadalcanal without leaving home, have a look at Guadalcanal walking a battlefield on YouTube. There you will find Dave showing you around uh, and explaining the sites. I'll put a link in the show notes and on the website. Next time, I'm once again joined by Eric Lee and we will be discussing Operation Foxley, the British plan to assassinate Hitler. So until then, I'm Angus Wallace and thanks for listening. Very 88 millimeter gun hit our tongue and blew us the hell out of it. The hell out of it. The hell out of it. Stalingrad can never be repaired. Be repaired. As Allied Commander in Chief, I have granted a military armistice.